Welcome to another edition of the Beacon of Truth. As you know, this program discusses the fundamental ideologies and beliefs of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, which is in fact those beliefs and that Islam that was given to us by our beloved master, the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam 15 centuries ago. Today we have the honor of being coming from Betul Ahad in East London. I would like to take this opportunity to formally welcome our Khudam brothers of East London and of course our most esteemed members of the panel. Assalamu alaikum to all of you. Now going straight into the program, one allegation that is often raised against the Jamaat is that God forbid Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed of Qadian alayhi salatu wasalam, he brought a new religion into the world and what he brought, his ideologies and fundaments were not based on Islam. So in response to this, I would like to first ask my panelists if, if they can give a, a response to this allegation. This is uh, an often repeated allegation that just because Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmad of Qadiyan has announced to be a prophet, therefore he has established a new religion. Now this is completely untrue and um, what we have to understand is that whenever Allah the Almighty sends prophets, it does not necessarily mean that they have come to bring a new law or they've come to change the existing law. We have ample examples of this in front of us. For instance, we have Hazrat Isa alayhi salatu wasalam, who although was a prophet, but in fact said that I have not come to uh, abolish the previous law or the prophets, but in fact I have come to fulfill. Now, similarly in Islam, both in the Holy Quran and the Ahadith, we find prophecies concerning of the advent of a Messiah to come in the latter days. Now, if we look at all these prophecies collectively from a wider angle, we come to find that this Messiah that was going to come was going to be a Nabiullah, i.e. he was going to be a prophet of God. He was going to establish a community that was going to be known as the al Jamaat, And the propagation and the revival of Islam was once again going to take place through him and his community. And despite being a prophet and having his own community, he was going to be imamukum minkum, i.e. he was going to be your leader from among you, i.e. he was going to be a Muslim. Now, those who do not believe in Hazrat Musaim as the promised Messiah and Imam Mahdi and assert this allegation against us, we ask them that if and whenever their Messiah does descend from heaven, according to these very prophecies, will he not have to claim to be a prophet and announce this to the whole world? Will he not have to establish a community so he can distinguish his members from the other Muslims who have not accepted their Messiah? Of course, he will have to do all of these things, but that does not mean that he has established another religion. Now, Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmad of Qadian alayhi salatu was salam, in light of these prophecies and by the commandment of Allah the Almighty, announced that he is a prophet of God. And even then he said that I am an Ummati Nabi, i.e. I am a subordinate to the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi and then established the community, i.e. the Amdiya Muslim Jamaat. And time and time again he said that we are not a separate entity from Islam, but in fact we are that community regarding whom the Holy Quran states وَآخِرِينَ مِنْهُمْ لَمَّا يَلْحَقُوا بِهِمْ That although they have come many, many years later after the Holy Prophet ﷺ, but in terms of spirituality and in rank, they are the same. They are like the Sahaba of the Holy Prophet ﷺ. And in fact, we can challenge anyone to bring anything from the life of the Promised Messiah ﷺ, from his books or even from the Khulafa where we have uh, abolished any law of Islam or introduced any new law into Islam. And yes, if Hazrat Musaim has abolished anything, then it was those customs and those traditions and those practices, i.e. those bid'at that had crept into Islam, for which there is no trace to be found in the Holy Quran, in the Sunnah of the Holy Prophet or even in the Sunnah of the companions of the Holy Prophet And these were those bid'at that lead to shirk. So Hazrat Musaim completely abolished shirk and presented the pure and the true image of uh, Islam. To falsify the claims of the Promised Messiah i.e. Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed of Qadian, people or so-called intellectuals, they say that this concept of a Messiah coming in the latter days is something not based on Islam, it's something un-Islamic, it's not in the Sharia. So in response to this, how, how, how can we defend ourselves from this? Well, this is a very important question because um, the Holy Quran is the word of God 
and it is our main source of guidance. And when we can find that the second advent of the Messiah has been mentioned in ahadith in such great abundance, then surely the Holy Quran must also have spoken on the matter. Well, the Holy Quran has spoken on the matter. And this becomes evident when we study the prophecies mentioned in the Holy Quran, which uh, speak of a reformer. Uh, the prophecies which are regarding the latter days, they speak of a reformer, who we can also call the promised Messiah. Um, 1400 years after Hazrat Musa Islam, when Bani Israel moved away from the teachings of the Torah, Allah sent Hazrat Isa salam in order to bring Bani Israel back to faith. He did not bring a new law, he came merely to um, reform Bani Israel. Similarly, 1400 years after the Holy Prophet وسلم, a Messiah was destined to come who would rejuvenate faith while being subordinate to the Holy Prophet وسلم. And um, this is because Allah says in the Holy Quran, Inna arsalna ilaykum rasulan shahidan alaykum kama arsalna ila fir'auna rasula that verily we have sent to you a messenger who is a witness over you just as we sent a messenger to Pharaoh. Here in this verse, Allah has clearly mentioned that the Holy Prophet وسلم, resembles Hazrat Musa Islam. So just as Hazrat Musa Islam was a law-bearing prophet, similarly, the Holy Prophet وسلم, was also a law-bearing prophet. However, it was also absolutely essential um, for a Messiah to come 1400 years after the Holy Prophet وسلم, in order for this resemblance to be complete and absolute. Hence, Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Muhammad salam, came in accordance with this verse of the Holy Quran and all the other verses in the Holy Quran which speak of a reformer. And then in Surah al Juma, um, Allah um, speaks of two advents of the Holy Prophet. Wasallam. The first being in the unlatted people of Arabia, and regarding the second advent of the Holy Prophet, وسلم, um, Allah says in Surah al Juma, وَآخِرِينَ مِنْهُمْ لَمَّا يَلْحَقُوا بِهِمْ وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَكِيمُ That he would send the Holy Prophet وسلم, for the second time among others who have not yet joined them. He is the mighty, the wise. Now the Holy Prophet وسلم, who was the recipient of this revelation and he could understand it better than anyone else, when he was asked what this verse meant, he placed his hand on the shoulder of the only non-Arab who was present at that time. And he said that when faith would rise to the Pleiades, someone from among them would bring it back. And then um, there's another verse in Surah uh, As-Saf, Allah says, هُوَ الَّذِي أَرْسَلَ رَسُولَهُ بِالْهُدَىٰ وَالدِّينِ الْحَقِّ لِيُظْهِرَهُ عَلَى الدِّينِ كُلِّهِ That it is he who has sent his prophet uh, with, the, uh, with, uh, with a guidance and the religion of truth, so that he may cause it to prevail over all religions. Now this was to happen at the hand of the promised Messiah. And uh, Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmad السلام, uh, gave us this understanding. And Allah had also guided other Muslim saints towards this meaning before him. Consequently, we find that uh, most commentators of, of the Holy Quran, they are agreed on the fact that this verse refers to the promised Messiah. And uh, they are agreed that this verse refers to the promised Messiah Islam. So coming back to the question whether um, uh, the Holy Quran speaks of a reformer or the coming of the promised Messiah. We have learned that yes, the Holy Quran does speak of the promised Messiah. And firstly, he would come, uh, his, he would come 1400 years after the Holy Prophet وسلم, and revive the religion of Islam. And secondly, um, his coming would be as if the coming of the Holy Prophet وسلم, himself. And thirdly, um, when he would come, uh, many religions um, all major religions would have become uh, apparent. They would have appeared in the world, and the religion of Islam would be made to prevail over all of them. So, the concept of the Messiah coming in the latter days is very much Islamic, and it's based on the Holy Quran. So, coming to Mansur, how can we actually attribute these signs to the Promised Messiah, i.e., Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmad al Qadi, alayhi salatu You see, one of the greatest signs of the advent of a prophet. Um, in this case, it being the Promised Messiah وسلم, is the time and error demanding the advent of such a person who would be a reformer and a guide. Now, looking throughout the entire history of the world, we see that exactly this has been the tradition of Allah the Almighty, that whenever mischief and evil takes over the world, and uh, times such as al-fasadu fil-bari wal-bahr arise, i.e. when corruption spreads throughout the entire world, 
He sends his beloved, beloved prophets to dispel the darkness and to save mankind from moral self-destruction and uh, to guide mankind onto that straight path once again. Now, similar to the time of uh, previous nations, this time was also demanding the advent of such a person. Um, the Holy Prophet, in fact, had mentioned the conditions of the latter days by way of revelation. He said that in the latter days, true faith would not be found among Muslims. Yes, there would be scholars, but they wouldn't really be leading the people towards guidance. Rather, whoever would turn to them in order to seek guidance would be misled. The mosques would be filled with people, but again, empty of guidance and righteousness. And last but not least, faith would have gone up to the Pleiades, and nothing would be left of Islam and the Holy Quran except their sheer name. Now, after the demise of the Holy Prophet وسلم, and after a long and gradual deterioration of Islam, we see that exactly these conditions arose in the 19th century. So if ever there was need of a prophet for spiritual guidance and darkness uplift, it was now. Now, even though there are thousands of signs which prove the truthfulness of the Prophet Messiah, instead of um, mentioning signs such as the lunar eclipse and so on, it seems more appropriate to mention a few aspects of his contributions towards the spiritual guidance and darkness uplift at this time of corruption. So in accordance with this, um, the first and foremost sign of the truthfulness of the Prophet Messiah in fact, the truthfulness of any prophet is his personal purity and his life amongst his people even prior to his claim. Just as Allah the Almighty mentions the criterion for the truthfulness of a prophet in the Holy Quran saying, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فقد لبثت فيكم عمرا من قبله أفلا تأكلون that is, I have indeed lived among you a whole lifetime before this. Will you, will you not then understand? Now, one thing should be understood here, that once the purity and the honesty of a person has been acknowledged, and there was no blemish found in his character even prior to his claim, it is impossible to then deny his purity and honesty once he has made his claim. Now, taking a glimpse at the life of the Promised Messiah, alayhi salatu wasalam, we see that from his early childhood, he was solely devoted to the worship of God, meditation and prayers. And he was always engaged in the service for the cause of Islam, so much so that he was known as a champion of Islam throughout the entire subcontinent. And not just by friends or family, no, but also great scholars and uh, in influential people of that time, who in fact later fiercely opposed his claims. Now, of his contributions towards that revival of Islam, towards the revival of faith was his magnificent book, Brahina Ahmadiyya. Now this was his first book and it consisted of incontrovertible arguments in favor of Islam, which answered all allegations raised by its enemies. And how greatly it was esteemed can be gauged by the writings of Muhammad Hassan Sabadalbi, who also turned out to be later, turned out to be one of the fiercest enemies of the Prophet Messiah, salatu wasalam. Now, one thing should be remembered here as well, that as a Muhammad Hussain Sabat Alwi wasn't just an ordinary man. No, he was considered to be one of the great scholars of Islam at that time. And upon that, he was acknowledged to be the chief of the ahl hadith sect. Um, he was also the editor of a journal named Isha'at al-Sunnah, in which he wrote a review on this book, Ay Ibrahim Ahmadiyya. And he testified to the character and the purity of the life of the Prophet Messiah, and he affirmed that his testimony about him was not just based on hearsay, but on long, intimate, and personal associations with the Prophet Messiah Now, in his um, testimony, he testified that this book, Ay Ibrahim Ahmadiyya, and the services of the Prophet Messiah towards Islam, by pen and purse, by personal character, by speech and silence, were without parallel throughout the entire history of Islam. And he challenged people that if it wasn't so, to present at least one book <coughs> which answered all the objections of the enemies of Islam with the same energy and with the same earnestness. Now similarly, we see that Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan Sahib was also amongst those people who testified to the character and the purity of the life of the Prophet Messiah Islam. And uh, he also affirmed that the claims of the Prophet Messiah Islam, especially with regards to jihad without the sword, were in fact exactly in accordance with the teachings of Islam and desperately needed at that time and age. So whether we're looking at the time um, prior to his claim or after, he made magnificent contributions towards the revival of faith. He wrote more than 90 books in which he repeatedly presented the true and beautiful teachings of Islam. 
And he presented, again, he presented such incontrovertible arguments in favor of Islam against all allegations made by his enemies, maybe Christians, Hindus, Sikhs, atheists, and so on, which left them all dumbfounded. He destroyed the Christian, the false and prevalent doctrines of Christianity and the belief of atonement um, by proving that Jesus Islam, in fact did not die on the cross. Um, he revealed truths such as as a Guru Baba Nanak Sahib accepting Islam. He refuted the Aryas and the belief of Wahdatul Wujud, i.e. believing everything to be God. And again, he presented astonishing speeches and debates, especially on the conference of great religions, which again was widely recognized and which proved the superiority of Islam over all other religions. Now, one of the greatest facts or one of the greatest aspects um, of his claims was that he challenged his opponents to refute his claims again and again. And as a matter of fact, he promised huge amounts as reward on doing so, but no one has been able to do so until this very day. So the question arises that was this not in fact the primary objective of that promised Messiah to come and present something so significant for that universal religion which was vanishing from the earth? Surely it was. So just in short, looking at every aspect of his life, looking at his contributions towards the service of Islam, we find evident proof that it was he who was sent as the Messiah and Mahdi for the revival of Islam. But again, one thing should be remembered here is that the promised Messiah only came to sow the seed, which would then flourish after him through his khulafa, and it is as we can all see today. So Hazul's character is the biggest testimony and Hazul's service to Islam is the biggest testimony to the fact that he was the promised Messiah والسلام, who was prophesied all those years ago. Now I'll turn to the our Qudam brothers who are in the audience today and open the floor for any questions. Yes, please, gentlemen. Assalamu alaikum. Um, my understanding is that uh, the Messiah will be uh, the common understanding is that the Messiah's return will be the return of Isa ibn Maryam. Now, we obviously believe that, believe that to be the promised Messiah. Um, I understand the logic in not stating the Messiah will be actually be uh, Mirza Ghulam Muhammad of India, because obviously every son born will be Ghulam Muhammad. But why was it um, not prophesied that there will be a return of someone like Isa ibn Maryam? So the question or often which is raised against the community that the prophecy was regarding Jesus, son of Mary. Yes. So how can we prove that prophecy to be fulfilled in the person of uh, Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed of Ghadiyan alayhi salatu so, so, um, No, I mean, why instead of saying it will be Isa alayhi salam? Okay, is, why did the, the prophecy why specific, say why be specified to Jesus, son of Mary instead of depicting it out to be the uh, I mean, I understand the logic of not, of not saying right. it will be this man in India, but it's someone like him, like who shares it. the attributes. Okay. Right. Uh, Rahman would like to respond to this. Yeah, um, it's a good question. <coughs> uh, basically, um, it is the Sunnah of Allah the Almighty that um, He doesn't, when He says something, He doesn't clearly say it. I mean, He speaks in metaphors because um, this world, it is a. Um, um, a trial for people and uh, you are to be judged and then um, at the end of the, your life Allah is to judge whether you're going to heaven or hell and um, so everything can't be as clear as daylight there has to be an aspect of secrecy in the matter so it can't be clearly said that um, like you said that um, someone like Mirza Ghulam Ahmed would come because um, we have in the Holy Quran and in Ahadith, we have indications towards the fact that it would be a different person. It wouldn't be Hazrat Isa alayhi salam himself. So for a person who looks at the Holy Quran and he studies it, he will find this reality. And um, um, the coming of the Messiah, um, the same Messiah that came for Bani Israel, his coming is, um, is opposed to uh, general um, logic. It's against logic. So if you look carefully in the Holy Quran, the Holy Quran clearly states that Hazrat Isa Islam has passed away and this can be proven and another person was to come. So, would you like to add something? Um, yes, um, just as Atta has just elaborated on that question, um, there are two wisdoms 
hidden or concealed in a prophecy. Um, one, as Atharamans just mentioned, that uh, in not mentioning the exact uh, attributes of that promised Messiah to come, there's uh, that sense of reward hidden in it. So if you believe in something in the unseen, which is, uh, you, is there's uh, that sense of reward which will, you will get after that in believing in that. Um, the second um, aspect of this was that um, the, w the fact of mentioning that the Messiah would be Isa bin Maryam is uh, actually referring to um, the state of the Muslims or the, the similarity between the Muslims and what had happened um, prior to him. Um, as as Atharaman just mentioned in his uh, answer earlier that uh, the Holy Prophet وسلم, and Hazrat Musa وسلم, were exactly uh, alike. And just as after Hazrat Musa وسلم, a Messiah came 1400 years after to revive faith again, um, similarly would there be a Messiah coming after the Holy Prophet وسلم, who would revive faith. So mentioning uh, the name of Isa bin Maryam is actually referring to the similarity between um, both uh, conditions. So just in addition to what Talman said that in the Holy Quran, very this wasn't any confusion when Hazrat Rasulullah said that a Messiah is to appear in the 14th century. There wasn't any confusion, even though he referred him as Isa ibn Maryam, but there wasn't any confusion that he was going to be the same Isa because the Quran very clearly states that Wama Muhammadun illa Rasul kad khalat min kabli Rasul. That the all the, the Holy all the prophets before the Holy Prophet وسلم, have all passed away. And then if we study the hadith in Bukhari, one of the most authentic books of the hadith, when Hazrat Sallallahu talks about the Messiah who came to the Bani Israel, he says that he had a, a, a reddish complex of hair, of hair. Then when he speaks about the Messiah that's going to come in the, in, in the 14th century, in the later days, he said that he's going to have long uh, uh, black hair. So obviously he's differentiated betwe between the two, so there was no confusion. And as uh, Mansur Sahib just said, that this was a similarity in attributes. And we find examples of this even before, as Atawar Mansa was talking about the, the, the Sunnatullah of, of Allah the Almighty. If we look in, uh, uh, um, the Prophet Moses said that Jesus will not come until uh, Elijah doesn't come back again. Now, we all know that Elijah had passed away. But what it meant, when Hazrat Isa made his claim that I am the Messiah, they asked him that they said, well, where's Elijah? He's supposed to come back again. And he referred to John the Baptist and said that he has come as Elijah. So the similarity always exists in uh, the history of religions. So you have to take the hadith as a collective thing. You can't just pick one out and start interpreting that on its own. You have to see the collection of the hadith and see that whether all those hadith are being fulfilled. And we see that this was actually a great prophecy of the Holy Prophet Someone, Jesus son of Mary, will come and descend back into the Muslim Ummah to uh, do the renaissance of Islam. Does that answer your question? It does, it does uh, to a large degree. Um, maybe I want it packaged very neatly in, in a nice present. Well, obviously, um, knowing what Isa al Islam went through in terms of the return of Elijah, um, on the face of it, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of wisdom in repeating that um, same issue again. Do you not agree with that? So, yeah, Should I sure. clarify? I can understand where, where you're coming from, but also what you have to understand is that the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam prophesized that my Ummah will eventually start to resemble like the Jews. He said like they split into 72 sects, my Ummah will split into 73 sects. And he said that they will be so similar like one shoe resembles the other shoe. So if you can see that the Ummah is being resembled between the two, that's why he said that the Messiah, the Messiah that will come will be like Isa ibn Maryam as well. That's why also in the, in the Quran, we every day in our Salat we recite that don't make us like the غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين They don't make us like those who have incurred thy displeasure and have gone astray. Who are those? The Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself prophesized that the maghdub are the Jews and ولا الضالين is meant by the Christians. So he says that we don't also become like them. So the similarity has been made by the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam which is why he has then um, characterized in terms of the similarity between the Messiah who's going to come in Islam and the one that's going to come and the one that came uh, for the uh, for the Jews as a collective it makes sense exactly that. Uh, any other questions yes the gentleman at the front Assalamu alaikum. Um, I just wanted to ask that uh, uh, the job of the Messiah and his community is to bring all Muslims together 
uh, as the as the you know the the rebirth of the final message of Islam and the Messiah is to unite all peoples. So as Ahmadis, why are we called Ahmadis? Because what we want to do is we want to tell other Muslims that look, we have this is the true unadulterated, this is the pure message. So if by if by calling us Ahmadis, it looks like we're saying come to us and we've got a separate religion. Because surely we should call ourselves Muslims uh, to show we you know the pure Islam. Um, and I know it's to distinguish between those who've accepted the promised Messiah and those who haven't. But surely we should we should be have the pure Islam, so then people can identify us rather than making another another name for us. And also, we're named after. It seems we're named after Hazrat Ahmed, and so surely we should be named after the Prophet or the religion, as opposed to the one guy who only had to continue the message. Named after the Holy Prophet because Ahmed is also a name given to the Holy Prophet But Adar Rahman, if you like to, yeah, it's a valid question. And yeah, the Holy Prophet his other name was Ahmed, I mean the person who has been praised the most. So we are named after him. And uh, Shazad's uh, in his answer previously has also he's already mentioned what the reason for this is. I mean, when the Messiah was com uh, to come, even the non amdis believe that when he would come, he would have to form some sort of community. And whenever a prophet comes, this happens that he comes and he has to br uh, bring about a party around him. And everyone else who looks from outside, they think that he's just started something very new. But in fact, it's nothing new. It's, it only appears to be new and different because um, the teachings that were given to them, they have gone far away from them. So. Um, this is the case with the Amdi community. Um, we are not a new religion, and that, uh, the answers we've been giving, that's exactly what we've been explaining, that we are not a new religion. Uh, we, have, we follow the same Holy Quran, we follow the same Adis, uh, we act upon the Sunnah of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu etc. So anyone who studies um, the Amdi community, they will realize that we are nothing new. Did that answer your question? Uh, any other questions? <coughs> yes, the gentleman at the back. My question is that everyone claims that we are a true Muslim, and everyone also has a message from the Hadith, and quotes from the Quran, so how will the common person know that it is true in Islam? The question is asked, that everyone, every sect of Islam calls themselves that Jamaat, that, that Jamaat which is going to be the victorious or the one who's going to be successful. So how can we distinguish between uh, the person or that, the Jamaat which is correct, which is on the right path, comparatively to those who are hell-bounded, which is mentioned in that hadith? Mansoor, if I like. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, again, that's a very valid question. Um, um, the simple answer to that is, um, of course, everyone can say that I'm, I am the right one. Um, I am going to be going to heaven, right? Um, but the question arises, what do you actually produce to prove yourself to go to heaven? Right? It's, uh, everyone, everyone can claim that, yes, I am the true Jamaat. Uh, of course, we will be going to heaven. Um, it's uh, what, just in comparison to the um, other sects in Islam right now, just compare the works which uh, right from the day the Prophet ﷺ was raised as a prophet until this very day. Just look at the contributions from our Jamaat on the behalf of Islam, um, just to revive Islam, um, what kind of services we have done um, over the years, and compare them with uh, what the rest of the sects of Islam have done. And uh, from there, you can, just, you can easily draw your conclusion as to who is um, right in calling themselves the, the heaven. Yeah. Uh, the hadith that where the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam speaks about his ummah being split into 73, I think that's m most appropriate to, to, to say now. He prophesied that there will be 72 sects, and then he said that one will be Wahiya uh, al-Jamaat, that one will be the Jamaat. Now, how do we uh, distinguish that Jamaat? And he, say, he, he himself uh, pointed out, he said, Ma'ana alayhi wa ashabi. That the way that the state of affairs that my me and my Sahaba similarly they that they will also have the similar state of affairs. Now, if we look at the the life of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu and his companions, we see that one of the most uh, one of the, one of the things that is most prevalent is the fact that they were persecuted. They were not allowed to say the namaz. They were not allowed to say the kalma. They were not allowed to go to the mosques. 
Now, if we look at all the sects uh, in Islam, who can, how can anyone say that is this happening to any other sect as much as it is happening to us? We resemble that, that Jamaat or that uh, group of Sahaba more than anyone else. So that's also another uh, testimony to the truthfulness of our Jamaat. Does that answer your question? Any more questions from the audience? Gentlemen at the front. <coughs> As alaykum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaykum wa Some of the allegations made by our non-Amidi brothers is that the Khulifah that followed the Promised yeah. Messiah as some is mainly comprised of his progeny. progeny. Yeah. How do we counter these arguments of nepotism and favoritism? When the Promised Messiah والسلام, prophesied about the second manifestation there, he did not mention anything about that these, that these individuals that will come as the Khulafa will be from his uh, progeny. And as the Tawr Man Sahib said as well, that the first, the very first Khalifa that came in Matam Diya was the Khalifa Tul Masiyah Wal Hazrat Mawlwi Hakim Nuruddin Sahib. Ta'ala he was not from the progeny of the, uh, of the Promised Messiah Neither is it in our constitution as well in the electoral committee that it has to be someone from the progeny. But what you have to remember is that when prophets come, they pray for their progeny, they pray for their children. And so and Allah the Almighty obviously listens to their prayers as well. And that is why through their progeny, individuals are born that then take up the role of Khilafat. And also we see this in the history of religions as well. Hazrat Ibrahim والسلام, he prayed extensively for his progeny and we find that from his progeny many prophets came. But that does not mean that it was hereditary or that you have to, from their progeny, elect the Khulafa. Does that answer your question? One more thing to add to the answer, which would maybe elaborate a bit more. Um, looking back at the time of the Holy Prophet وسلم, we see that all of his four Khulafa were related to him in one way or another. So I'm mean, like, where are you going to draw this line with this allegation? Does that answer your question? Thank you. Uh, are there any more questions? Yes, the gentleman right at the back. Shams. One of the Jesus states that one of the signs of the promised Messiah and the Imam Mahdi will be that he will distribute money to his people and this money will be rejected, it will be refused. And one of the allegations against, um, that can be made against the Jamaat al Mahdiyat is that did this, did, this did not happen. Can you shed some light I, on this I issue? I think the words aren't money, I think it's wealth but, uh, and treasures. Wealth, sorry, I yeah. think it's treasures, the word is treasures. But it's, um, just as Kudus has just uh, mentioned, uh, that the actual term that's been used is wealth. And uh, looking at the works of the Prophet Messiah, we see that, uh, first of all, talking about wealth, what does it in fact mean by wealth in this context? It means spiritual wealth. Okay, um, now looking at the works of the Prophet Messiah, we see that uh, throughout his entire life he wrote, as I mentioned earlier as well, more than 90 books, and uh, which are in fact named Ruhani Khazayim, meaning um, spiritual treasures. So that was, as prophesied by the Holy Prophet, so, so his uh, work to present this spiritual wealth for the service of Islam. So the spiritual wealth was presented, the Holy Promised Messiah did present it to the world, but many people rejected this. So this was in, in accordance with the prophecy of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Shazad, would you like to add something? He also said if you start taking these prophecies literal, literally, then you're in a very dangerous situation Actually. because regarding the Messiah, the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that salib wa yaktulul khanzir, that these were going to be the two aspects of of his coming as well, that he was going to kill the swine and he was going to break the cross. Now, if you take this literally, I mean, that's against the dignity of any prophet that you send him out breaking crosses literally and killing the pig. So obviously, it's it's in a metaphoric sense, as Masoud Sahib just said, that it's the wealth, the treasures that he gave through his arguments and through his books. And if you take it literally, I don't think, it, again, it wouldn't be fulfilled in, in this current situation, in this current time that we're in, when we've been hit by the financial crisis. I don't think there'll be anyone who'd, if someone was offering them wealth, that wouldn't accept it. So obviously, it's obviously a metaphor. And as uh, Mansur Saab said, that it was those, the Ruhani Khazain, the, uh, the heavenly treasures that he gave and the arguments. And we can see that many people don't even accept them. Exactly. Hey, Atta? Yeah, I just wanted to say that, I mean, the Promised Messiah, he wrote these, um, the, the Ruhani Khazain. And he, if you study his life, the amount of effort, the amount of effort he put into this, and uh, he devoted all his efforts to write these books. But what have people done? They raised allegations against um, the work that he's produced. He d defended um, Islam from the onslaughts of the opponents of Islam. But people raise allegations. They say that he has merely written these books in support of his claim. He's only um, you know, 
proved that uh, the death of Jesus or tried to prove this. But we have to look that even if the uh, promised Messiah, he um, presented a few verses of the Holy Quran and he pondered over them, then this is a bigger uh, achievement and it is a bigger source of treasure um, and uh, service to Islam than any of the other people who raise these ob objections have done. So, again, coming to the gentleman here. Do you have any? Yeah. As none of the people think that uh, is a new religion, I want to ask a question. As some uh, non md mullahs, ulamas, put uh, allegation on Ahmadiyya that the Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmad of Qadiyan uh, stopped the jihad of sword. That is the change in the, uh, in the teaching of Islam. And this is uh, some, one uh, allegation that is a, it is a new religion. I want to ask this. So I think you raised this point that even so Sayyid then commented on this. So if you'd like to elaborate on this. Exactly. I mean, first of all, it should be understood that the teaching of Islam itself is peace all over. So um, even looking at, the, at uh, the jihad with the sword at the time of the Holy Prophet وسلم, we have to understand that how did this come to happen? Why did he raise the sword for, for the jihad? Um, so we find that after a long um, persecution of the Meccans um, in Mecca obviously, which it drove him out of his uh, hometown into uh, Medina. And even when they didn't stop over there, he was uh, told by Allah the Almighty that, okay, um, you're being brutally uh, persecuted by your opponents. Now it is time for you to raise the sword to answer their per uh, persecution. So um, the whole concept of <coughs> the jihad with the sword was only limited to that time and era, which uh, when the Holy Prophet himself was facing um, the, the, the sword of the opponents and to answer that sword of the opponents he was granted permission to answer with the sword. Um, now in this, at this time of era there's no one, no mullah comes up to you, no one, no one in general um, uh, raising arguments against Islam comes up to you with a sword and says hey answer me, right? So um, it's just common sense right now that if someone argues with you with his mouth um, it is up, it's, it's your job, it's your duty to answer his um, allegations by your arguments. See, the onslaught though, nowadays is through the pen and through argumentation. So we see in the lifetime of the Promised Messiah, Islam, he did not abrogate jihad. He said a new form of jihad is the, is the time of the pen, it's the time of argumentation. That's exactly what he done, and we see that he wrote in over 90 books, as uh, Mansur said. So that's, it was the jihad changed, the form changed, but jihad is still there. And these non MDs, if they raise an allegation saying that, he abrogated the Sharia in a way. It's totally false. Next question, please. Jee. Salaam alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. The uh, arguments raised by our non ahmadi brothers is about the Khatam al Nabiin and the coming of Hazrat Mizah Qalam Ahmed, that no other Prophet can come after Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Could you shed some light on this, please? Atta, coming to you first. Um, yeah, um, well, if we study the Holy Quran, there are many verses that um, the, um, that prove that a prophet can still come. If we study the ayat al Khatam al Nabiin itself, um, which says, "Azbillah min al-Shaytan rajim Ma kana Muhammadun aba ahadim min rijalikum, walakin Rasulullahi wa Khatam al Nabiin." That Muhammad is not the father of any um, male offspring. In uh, in fact, um, he is the messenger of Allah, and not only the messenger of Allah, but he is the seal of the prophets. Now, the word lakin in this uh, uh, verse, it means the same thing as the word but in English. So like, um, if the first part of the sentence before but is in the positive, then after following the, uh, uh, this word, you will always find that the negative is, uh, uh, follows it. So for example, you can say that um, uh, not only um, I like uh, apples, but I do not like bananas. But you cannot say, I like apples, but I also like bananas. It won't make sense. Similarly is the case with this Arabic uh, um, lakin. And um, what, what this means is that when Allah said that the Holy Prophet وسلم, wasn't the father of any male son, he, uh, he said that 
uh, when uh, people would think that this, um, this is something bad, now, d does he not have uh, any offspring? Because in that time, you have to look at Arabia at that time, people used to raise this allegation that the Holy Prophet ﷺ doesn't have any male offspring. And it was considered to be a bad thing. So Allah says that this is not a bad thing. If you consider this bad, then look, he is the messenger of Allah. And if you study Surah Al-Azab in which this verse comes, it says in the beginning that the Holy Prophet ﷺ is a spiritual father of uh, the Muslims. So um, the Holy Prophet ﷺ, he was the messenger of Allah, meaning he was the spiritual father um, of the Muslims. And not only that, he was the, he was the seal of the prophets. So um, this, this, those who raise this allegation that you know Khatam and or not an allegation who who are of this uh, this mindset that Khatam and Nabiin basically means the last prophet, no prophet after him. That's contradictory to their own belief as well because they themselves believe that Hazrat Isa والسلام, is going to come from the heavens. Is he not going to be a prophet? Of course he's going to be a prophet. Does that seal of Khatam and Nabiin then do not break? Of course it then breaks. So obviously Khatam and Nabiin does not mean that he is the last prophet and there will be no prophet after him. The Holy Prophet Sallallahu said that learn half the, the faith from Hazrat Aisha Taala Anha. Now, if we look what Hazrat Aisha Taala Anha said about this, she said, Qulu innahu khatamul wa la taqulu la nabiya ba'dahu. That say he is the Khatam and Nabiin, but don't say that there is no prophet after him. Of course there's going to be a prophet after him because the Holy Prophet Sallallahu has prophesied of Hazrat Isa Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that he's going to, be, to, going to come. Obviously, it's, it's in the metaphorical sense, but he's obviously going to be a prophet. And also, we claim, and also the, the Quran itself states that we are khairi ummah, that we are the best uh, ummah. Now, what, what, what ummah has, has uh, you know, uh, gone before us? That was the, uh, the mosaic dispensation. And in that, we find that after Azim Musa, wasalam, many prophets came. And uh, in fact, many of the, the, the women of the, that dispensation received revelations. So why should we say that we, on one hand, say that we are khairi umam, and on the other hand, say that there will be no prophet after the Holy Prophet Sallallahu and there will be no revelation after that? Of course, there will, a prophet will come, and that prophet has come, as Mirza Ghulam Ahmad of Qadiyan, But he came as a subordinate prophet. He said that everything, everything I have achieved is because of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu He came as an ummati nabi, and yes, prophets can come, but in compliance and in complete obedience to the Holy Prophet Muhammad Mustafa Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay, I mean, like, fine, it just says, um, uh, answered by Shazad Saab as well, very nicely. Um, but even if we do take Khatam um, al to be the last prophet, what do we take of it? The last law bearing prophet, of course. So, what it means is that after the Holy Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi uh, the Holy Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he brought the last law which would then never change, or nothing would come after it. But yet prophets in his succession could come, who would then, as we have mentioned, that um, at times such where his faith would have gone up to the Pleiades and such and such, there would be a need of a prophet who would then again reform the nation. Um, and also um, the term Khatam, um, when it is used with uh, a group of uh, higher society, if you want to say, Saiba Fazilat Guru, Right. Um, it actually refers to high ranks. high ranks. Exactly. It refers to the person um, of the highest quality there. So I mean, like we find various terms. So it's proven from the Arabic lexicon exactly as well. Exactly. Throughout. Khatam al Nabi means um, the best of prophets. Right. Khatam al Shuhada means the best of poets. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, the panelist. Any more questions from the audience? So similarities can we draw between the time of Prophet Muhammad sallam and uh, Promised Messiah in terms of acceptance of their message? Okay, so the acceptance of the message, how similar were they, uh, or how unsimilar were they? Can the panel shed some light on this? Coming to Atar first. Okay. Um, well, uh, when the Holy Prophet ﷺ was given his mission by, the Holy, uh, by Allah the Almighty, and uh, he received the revelation of the Holy Quran to go and propagate the message of Islam, um, let's look at what happened. He went out, and uh, first, he propagated the message um, just between the, um, you know, the close people, the people who were around him, the um, and he didn't um, make his claim openly. And uh, because um, initially he was afraid that people may not accept. And then you had people like Hazrat Abu Bakr, 
who, when, when the Holy Prophet ﷺ was trying to defend himself and uh, support his claim so that he wouldn't sound absurd, Hazrat Abu Bakr said, no, no, just stop there and uh, just let me accept you for what I know you to be because I know that your life before was uh, pure and it was based on truthfulness and you were known as Amin and as Siddiq. The criterion which was established before that their life, their previous life is a testimony to their truthfulness. Yeah, and similarly if you look at the <coughs> promised Messiah Islam, when he made his claim, um, Hazrat Khalif Tumasi Yawal, Hazrat Hakim Olvi Nuruddin Sahib, he um, believed in um, Hazrat Masih Muhammad Islam and uh, his, you can say he was uh, very his um, belief in the promised Messiah was similar to that of Hazrat Abu Bakr because he did, didn't uh, ask for any proof but he believed him just for the, the way he knew him because his life was, uh, he was witness to his life that it was a, a, um, a pure life yeah. Yeah. Just as the one saying that the Holy Prophet Sallallahu was commanded as well the first that be that wherever you've been commanded openly go and say that message Similarly, as a Muslim, whatever message, well, I mean, he wasn't given any new message, but whatever command he was given by Allah the Almighty, he openly declared it. He said that I'm the Mujaddid of the 14th century. He said I'm the Imam Mahdi of this time, the Messiah, and I'm the Ummati Nabi. He openly declared his message. And then just as the, the, the righteous beings at the time of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu accepted his message and they were awaiting for a prophet. Similarly, in this time, in this age, there were many people who were saying that we need a Messiah now. There is a very famous couplet of, uh, of uh, um, Sufi Jan Sahib who said that uh, we are ki ya tum par nazar tum masiha bano khuda ke liye that we we are spiritually ill and we are look to you to become the Messiah. You know, for God's sake, become the Messiah. But as Masih Muhammad said, until God does not announce that I am the Messiah and I should take the bath um, um, and etc. Then until that, I'm not going to do it. So everything was dependent up upon the revelation from God. But when and as and when as the Messiah Muhammad received that revelation and received those commands, he gave the command of bath, he uh, established the community. And then just as in Islam, we see uh, in, in the early days of Islam, we see that these righteous beings, they, they recognized and accepted as the, the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Similarly, the, Messiah, the promised Messiah, they also accepted him. And the, the success of um, the Holy Prophet Sallallahu and the success of as the Messiah Islam is the same. It's actually the success of Islam itself. So again, it's something progressive. We see that the claims of the Holy Prophet started from an area which is short and then slowly and slowly um, he was told by God Almighty to expand his area and eventually he was called Rahmatul Alameen, the merciful mankind. Similarly, the claims of the Promised Messiah they, they were from Mujaddid, then the Messiah, etc. So we see there's a progressive thing and there's a very big similarity and resemblance both in the Holy Prophet and the Promised Messiah's claims. Now, the last point I would like to come to is um, to Tawriman here that there are some offshoots in Islam like Bayyat and some certain individuals say that at least they are better in one way that they have declared themselves a separate entity of Islam they have their own practices, they have their own faith but unfortunately <coughs> the Ahmadi community according to them they're hypocrites because they do, do, they do not declare themselves to be a separate, separate entity when they believe in another prophet and uh, uh, such, uh, such allegations. So how do you respond to this? Well, this allegation is completely unfounded. It implies that if a person um, declares the prophethood of Hazrat Muhammad وسلم, to be no longer valid and he claims to have brought a law superior to the Holy Quran and he changes the kalima and he, and he uh, presents a new kalima and he changes the prayers and the qibla then that is not so bad. But if a person claims that the Holy Prophet وسلم, is the seal of the prophets and his law to be the last law and he believes that every word of the Holy Quran is under the protection of God Almighty then this is not good, it, 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 it is con considered to be bad and um, he should be boycotted so um, people can judge for themselves and then um, it is wrong to compare the Ahmadiyya community to any offshoot of Islam regardless of whether it is Bahayat or any other because the Ahmadiyya community, right from the outset, have upheld the teachings of the Holy Quran as well as the Sunnah of the Holy Prophet wasallam, And um, the founder of the Ahmadiyya community, as well as the Khulafa of Ahmadiyyat, 
they, they have never detached themselves from Islam. In fact, they reiterated the teachings of Islam, the Islamic Sharia. And uh, in, in fact, they devoted all their efforts and strived very hard day and night in this cause. So, and then um, these, they act upon the teachings of the Holy Quran, they propagate the message of Islam, and um, they pray according to the way the Holy Prophet ﷺ taught the Muslims to pray, and they pay the zakat, and they wish to perform the hajj, but unfortunately, uh, they are stopped from performing it. Now the question is, who has moved away from Islam? Is it the people who are dying to perform hajj, or is it the ones who are stopping them? Now, we do not uh, want people to take our words. We want them to look at the facts and decide for themselves. Um, who were the people who used to be um, uh, killed or martyred for proclaiming the kalima? Was the Muslims or the kuffar? And who were the ones who were on the other end killing the people for proclaiming the kalima? Was it the Muslims or the kuffar? So we leave this matter for people to decide for themselves. So, of course, the MD community is not just an offshoot of Islam, but it is a renaissance of Islam. It is that message that was preached by the Holy Prophet some 15 centuries ago, and the promised Messiah, who was prophesied again from the Holy Quran and the Ahadith of the Holy Prophet came into, the, into this world, was commissioned by God Almighty to serve and to do the renaissance of Islam. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the Khudam of East London for being with us today and allowing us to be in Bet al-Ahad today. And of course, our esteemed members of the panel, Jazakumullah to all of you. And most import importantly, Jazakumullah for the viewers at home for viewing the Beacon of Truth. Uh, with this, uh, we'll take leave. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allahumma <laughs>